James became deeply involved with the African independence movement, editing pamphlets and working closely with George Padmore, a fellow Trinidadian. Padmore was not a Trotskyist, but a communist, who had spent a number of years working in Moscow, but who by this time was primarily concerned with colonial freedom and the anti-imperialist struggle. Padmore and I had known one another as boys, 10 years old in the Caribbean. His father was a teacher, my father was a teacher. They both were friends and they used to meet and speak and we and George and I used to play together. But his father's name was Nurse, Alfonso Nurse. And he was Malcolm Nurse. Then he left and went away and I in the Caribbean began to read as the years went by and hear about a revolutionary leader named George Padmore. So I, I come to England. I come to England in 1932, somewhere in 34, 35. I hear that Padmore is coming from America or is going to have a meeting in London. So I go to see the great man. I go and see Malcolm Nurse. So he said, well, boy, how is it? And after the meeting, we went somewhere and having something to eat till four in the morning talking. So in spite of your political differences, you and Padmore are increasingly able to work together. We were always able to work together. George would be in the Communist Party, I was a Trotskyist, but that didn't matter. We would always meet and talk and eat together. And is that around the, the African question? And no, what? it wasn't. We were friends and became friends. Padmore was, had, was a great admirer of Marxism. And although he had left the, 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 the Moscow people, he made me to understand that for him, Marxism still remained the center of his political ideas. And we formed the Pan-African Congress. When was that? About 1937, I believe, I was the chairman. It was a very vague. We got together, but we chiefly to the idea of Africa. Caribbean didn't matter so much. He was full of the African history, Marxism, and I was full of the European history, which he appreciated as something I used to insist that Marxism takes off from where the historians, politicians, and economists of the bourgeois society finish. Their Marxism begins, the political economy and so forth. And Padmore very much appreciated that. In addition to that, he was a very social person, a very fine person. He's very good looking, very elegant, and so forth. And a Marxist, undeviating, but ready to talk to anybody. He was one of the old West Indian types. I don't know if you know what I mean. Tell the me that. old Victorian type. He was one, but a Marxist. And he didn't lose that. The old Victorian, you know, it was easy enough to imagine him in a frock coat and a topper. But he wasn't, but he was an elegant person, fine manners, speech, style sympathetic, friendly, but undeviating masses. Oh, yes. Now, let me tell you, the persons whom I remember most clearly are George Padmo, Kenyatta, myself, one or two Nigerians. But Kenyatta was no more a Marxist than he was a follower of John Milton. Kenyatta joined the movement because it was a struggle against the imperialists. Padmore kept a balance, but his orientation was to make the movement be aware of the colonial struggle. I was the chairman, but Padmore was the one. Padmore taught me the importance of Pan-Africa. James's major work of this period was Black Jacobins, a history of the successful slave revolt in 1791 in what was then San Domingo and is now Haiti. Black Jacobins points the connections between black movements in the Caribbean and the revolutionary developments in France. To research the book, James had to spend a great deal of time in Paris. 
life was a great center and I was fairly fluent in French at the time. And then I was a black man. And what was remarkable that they really were surprised that I knew more about French literature, apart from Greek and Roman, than they did, than some of the French people did. Because the French people were reading modern French literature, but I had done Molière and Racine, Corneille at school, and I taught it. So here was I, black, and I didn't know too many black people in those days, speaking French and familiar with French literature. I remember walking along with Braun, very intelligent man, Czechoslovakian, was killed afterwards, but fluent in English literature and everything else. And we were walking along the street in Paris, and he was very sophisticated, very made a reference, he says, that question slipped me and I told him, I think I must have told him Racine or Corneille. So he stopped, but he, he, I remember, he says, Jim, where do you come from? <laughs> and I had to explain to him, I say, your problem is in regard to me, you have in mind Africa, African tribes, African language. A West Indian is not that. English is my native language, and I was 10 years of age, I was doing Greek and Latin. So I grew up, and then after a year or two, French literature and French language. So, that, so that's me. So that I would know this is not surprising. What would be surprising is if I didn't know it. So, Are you the, uh, had people worked on the primary documents of the Saint Domingue Revolution in Paris before you went into there those were archives? Some writers. There were no people in English, but there were French writers who had done. But uh, none of them were Marxists, you see. And I had an angle, a method of handling the same material that they had handled with different results. That book created quite a sensation. It still remains the standard text, you know, after nearly 50 years. And they, in France in particular, they were glad to see it because there were no such books. Okay, with all due respect, can we come to an end? I'm very tired. You've written eloquently in this period about your friendship and relationship with Paul Robeson. I knew Paul, and like everybody who knew him, had an immense liking and respect for this magnificent person. He's the most astonishing person I have ever met. Not only he could sing, he was a good actor. He wasn't super, but his presence, and in addition to all these gifts which impressed the public, he was a marvelous man in private conversation. Paul would speak and speak at length, but he had the faculty that very few have, very few great speakers. He could listen. And he could talk a length of time and then listen to you and keep on listening. So you were never bothered by him. He's an extraordinary human being. He's a man I remember very well, very clearly, and with a great deal of respect and satisfaction. Did you agree with him politically? No, I wouldn't say that, but I kept away from that. I believe that the Stalinists made more of Paul's association with them than he did. He never said he belonged to anything, but he went along and would refer to them, and they would pick it up as Paul Robeson said. Robeson, Stalin, the Communist Party, Paul Robeson, they kept that going. But Paul was, if anything, sympathetic to them. But I believe the man I knew was somewhat cautious because he was a public figure. And to commit himself to those people would have been a technical mistake, a social mistake. In addition, personally, well, they, they're ready. They were Paul Rosen all the time. If you yes. listen to them, you would believe. But he, even talking to me, 
he would say, well, you know, see Allah, leave it there. Of course, Robeson played Toussaint Louverture. Yes. That was he a... played Toussaint Louverture. That was before I went to the United States. That was in Britain here. And I wrote the play before I published The Black Jacobins. I don't know what was in my head. And then somebody saw it and told me. So I used to, t everybody used to talk to Paul and be glad to be in his company in the 30s. It was very difficult, you know. Black people were isolated, there were so few of us. So I used to meet him periodically. We'd have some tea somewhere or something. Some people talk. So I met him and I told him, by the way, I have a play, you know. And people think that you would do very well. I think so too. He said, well, let me see it. And in those days, there weren't many plays in which a leading part would be played by a black man. So he read it and told me, yes, I would. And from there it went. That was written before uh, Black Jacobin was published. Written but the before. whole conception of Black Jacobin. The conception was, was there, there, but uh, I had written essays here and there, and I delivered lectures. I mean, people now talk about Black Jacobins as an important historical book, but really, it was also a thesis about contemporary Black politics. Wasn't it, it was, and politics that is fundamental is always applicable to different periods of history because fundamental politics always has behind it the struggle of different classes. Different sections of the class can struggle and kill one another, but that is not much a social event as when one social structure is fighting against another part of the social structure. Certain logical and historical things emerge which are applicable to similar periods a thousand years before or after. But what is the significance of Toussaint Louverture for you? I mean, how do you see the connection between those events in, in Haiti then and the 20th century politics? I have already said during the last few minutes that any great revolutionary event in history, from it you can always find principles and historical movement ideas that are complied to others. I was saying that before. Now, that is so in any great revolution, and the San Domingo Revolution was the first great revolution of black people. Now, when you consider the role that Africa was going to play in the world in the years to come, that then acquires a significance. Furthermore, it was a part of the French Revolution. So that you have in that historical event a duality in which it takes part in the great revolutions is very important. The first was the British. And at the same time, it points the finger to the revolutions among colonial peoples. So that that revolution is something that is worthy of consideration by every type of historian. If even you're studying the French Revolution, that is the extreme point of the French Revolution in Europe. But at the same time, it's the beginning of the colonial upheavals. So that is, a, from the point of view of the historian, a significant, in fact, a dominating feature of the study of history.